kiddo, so welcome back to part two of Atomic Theory, Nature of Chemistry. We're gonna jump right in. We're gonna start talking about Dalton's atomic theory because this is the point that we go from sort of the alchemist really, you know, not really having a coherent system um, for chemistry to, hey, let's move this forward. Let's have some logical, concrete reasons for what we're doing. So Dalton's atomic theory starts out with something that we saw with the Greeks and Democritus um, in our last video, which is that elements are made up of small particles called atoms. Okay, so again, that should sound familiar to you. Um, that was what Democritus believed. That was what some of the Greeks at the time believed. They, of course, believed that there were only four elements. And by Dalton's time here um, in the 1700s, they knew that there were a lot more elements than that. They had isolated several things down to their purest form as elements. And so Dalton's contention was that those elements were made up of small particles that were called atoms. So another couple of really important points to Dalton's atomic theory is that not only did he believe that elements are made up of small particles called atoms, but that if those atoms were from the same element that they were identical. In other words, every atom of gold looked like every other atom of gold. Every atom of silver looked like every other atom of silver. And then his, the, the obviously corollary to that would be that atoms of different elements are then going to have different weights from each other. And so it was Dalton's contention that one of the ways that you could tell the elements apart is that when you got down to the atomic level, that each atom would have a different weight if it belonged to a different um, element. Now, of course, that is somewhat similar to what we have today. If you looked on the periodic table, most of the elements are going to have different weights. In fact, that's sort of one of the original ways the periodic table got put together um, is by using those different weights. We, are, of course, are a little bit more sophisticated about our knowledge of the atom but, but again, we're starting off with Dalton's atomic theory and then we're gonna go from there. We also know, of course, today that all atoms of the same element aren't necessarily identical. Um, we know about isotopes and we'll talk about that a couple of videos down the road. So another couple of things that Dalton said, and the first of these, this is like the biggest, I, I would say like the biggest flaw in Dalton's atomic theory to us now, but it's understandable why he would make it at the time, which is that under Dalton's theory, atoms were indivisible, meaning that you couldn't break an atom down into smaller things. Atoms, in, in his mind, were the smallest fundamental building block of the universe. There was nothing smaller than that. We, of course, know now, and we'll see as we go throughout our videos here on atomic theory, that we could break that down into other um, smaller parts. Um, so atoms are indivisible. That was one of his points that we obviously know isn't true now. What really sort of sets Dalton's theory apart and really like takes what the Greeks had and goes a little bit further um, into really important territory for us that will lay the foundations for chemistry for a time to come is that Dalton comes up with the idea that atoms combine with each other and that that's what forms compounds. That's what forms essentially every other species of chemical and that they not only do they combine, but they combined in very fixed types and numbers. And so what does that mean? Well, I mean, we would state that today as the law of definite proportions. And that would essentially state that, hey, every water molecule has hydrogen and oxygen in it. And that those hydrogen and oxygen are always in a ratio of two atoms of hydrogen to one atom of oxygen. Now, of course, back in Dalton's day, they didn't know that. They would have stated that more in a weight percentage um, or a weight ratio than they would have that. But regardless, that idea of the law of definite proportions is really, really super important and fundamental to us um, going forward into what chemistry actually is. And so if we, if we look at Dalton's atom, I mean, essentially Dalton's atom is what we would term as like the billiard ball model. It's a solid object. So this is a gold atom, say, um, and it's a solid object. We can't break it apart. It doesn't break down into anything smaller. There's nothing inside of it, it just is. That's the most fundamental thing. Um, and that actually serves us really well. There are a lot of times throughout um, your, the rest of your education in science that you're gonna treat atoms that way, as though they were these small, hard spheres that collided with each other and bounced off of each other and sometimes stuck together. Um, that idea of the atom, still that model of the atom is, still has power for us. It still has a lot of explanatory power for us and works for us in a lot of ways. And I want to digress just a little bit as we're talking about atomic theory here. What's important to remember is that what we're doing is we're building up to the modern model of the atom. And the models are one of these things that are really super important in science because a model is this is how we describe the, the phenomenon that we're observing. So we're taking measurements, we're doing observations, and then we come up with a model that explains why we believe that happens. Um, those models can be altered. That's what science is all about, is about taking 
a model and refining it, changing it, and in a few cases completely throwing it out um, and trying something different. And so as we go through our models of atomic theory here, you're going to see that it's constantly changing, and it may change in the future. Once we get to the quantum model, which is the model of the atom that we follow today, new advances can tell us more about it that can refine that model, and again, in some cases, even overthrow a model altogether. So remember that when we're talking about all of these things, when we talk about um, these atoms, when we talk about molecular geometry, when we talk about localized electron model, and all this stuff that we're going to talk about this year, that these are models that, that we're taking the the data and the observations that we have and doing our best to come up with a rational explanation for why those things work that way. And we continue to collect data and sometimes those things change. So that's, that's how models work. Make sure that you always understand that everything that we're talking about here is a model. So our next model that we're gonna jump to comes from a guy named Thompson. Thompson does this experiment called the cathode ray tube experiment, really fundamental experiment. You need to know what the experiment is so it, does, it certainly won't hurt to jump outside of the video at some points and do a little extra research. And this is in 1897. So remember Dalton's back in the 1700s. So 100 years past, you're like, nothing happened. Well, lots of stuff has happened for chemistry, but for atomic theory, they didn't really have the instrumentation um, to do anything until they got to the advent of electricity. Um, and so that really is what's gonna sort of help everything along in terms of determining things about atomic theory. So Thompson's cathode ray tube experiment, he's firing a beam here in this device called a cathode ray. Cathode ray tube, you guys sort of know what that is, back like an old style TV, um, the really big TVs, not the flat screens, those are all worked under the principle of a cathode ray um, tube where you've got a beam fired off on one side and you've got a, a, essentially a phosphorant, I believe, uh, glass plate there, and it's gonna light it up in different ways and that's what's gonna project the image onto the screen. So in Thompson's experiment, he's firing the cathode ray um, and it's going from one end down to the other end. Um, and so essentially there's, there's a positive charge pulling it on one end, negative on the other. So the beam is flying through here. Um, and what Thompson notices is if he puts a magnetic poles on the other sides here, positive charge, negative charge, so positively charged plate on this side, negatively charged plate on this side, that what happens is this beam that he's firing bends. It doesn't keep going straight which seems pretty weird because like this is matter going on here and he's just got like these poles here. So why is it changing its course? Why is it changing its direction? Well, Thompson's obvious conclusion here is that it must be negatively charged because I've got a negative charge here. I've got a positive charge up here. It's going towards the positive charge and away from the negative charge. We all know that like charges repel each other and opposite charges attract. And so, Thompson notices this deflection of his beam, and he does a bunch of experiments then, and what he discovers is that there's a charge to mass ratio um, that he gets out of this. And so essentially what this boils down to is Thompson discovers the existence of something called the electron. So why is this so important? Well, because this, is, this experiment is the first time that they had real, like some real proof that atoms were not indivisible, that you could break them down into something that was smaller than an atom. The smallest atom is a hydrogen, and the beam here, they were discovering the particles there were much smaller than a hydrogen, and so that meant that you could break an atom down into something smaller, and that something smaller was the electron. Also, obviously, from the experiment itself, they knew that that particle was negatively charged, which leads to a whole bunch of other interesting things because they knew that atoms are electrically neutral. And so if there's a negatively charged particle that they're gonna dub the electron, then that must also mean that there's, a pos there's positive charge there somehow as well. So what Thompson proposes is what's called, what comes to be called the plum pudding model. Okay, and the plum pudding model works like this. Instead of it being a billiard ball, like a solid mass, Thompson proposed that most of the atom was like just this big block of positive charge and then that there were these negatively charged electrons sort of just around embedded in it. That model gets called the plum pudding model. Um, it gets called the plum pudding model because essentially it was saying it was like a pudding, an English pudding with a bunch of pieces of plum in it. That doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to us nowadays and certainly probably as Americans also because we don't eat a whole lot of plum pudding. So I like to think of it as the chocolate chip cookie model where the model is that there's a cookie base, positive charge, and then there are a bunch of chocolate chips, electrons, 
embedded within that. So there's a solid mass, a positive charge with some like little sprinklings in there, little chips in there of negative charged electrons. So that's Thompson's cathode ray tube experiment. Really fundamental, massively important experiment. Um, it's followed up by Millikan's oil drop experiment. Okay, and in Millikan's oil drop experiment, what Millikan does is he, he absolutely determines the actual charge of an electron. And since Thompson had already discovered what the charge to mass ratio was, then after Millikan's experiment, then they knew what the actual mass of an electron was. And they knew that that mass was smaller than any atom. So all of this together says, hey, we can break down an atom into smaller parts. Okay, so that's the next model that we get to. We go from Dalton's model of small billiard ball to Thompson's plum pudding model because we know about the existence of the electron. We're going to pause there um, on this video and then we're going to jump into the, the further models in the next set of videos because we've got more experiments that are going to take some more time to talk about. Okay, so thanks a lot, kiddos.